this panel will be on the theme entitled Healing and Reconciliation, which is an effort uh, developed by the Muslim Alliance in North America. Uh, really, its primary goal is a, was to foster cooperation among the various segments of the Muslim community, and it's based on the verse of the Quran in Surah Al Imran when Allah SWT reminds us, Wa atasimu bihablillahi jamia wa la tafarraku, that hold all of you tight to the rope of Allah and do not be divided. With that in mind, I wanted to give you some elements of this campaign. And you have, by the way, brochures in front of you to explain more about the organization itself. So I will not take time to do that. The campaign is really a long time coming in some ways because we have had people who have transcended the boundaries, if you will, of race and ethnicity and nationality. But more often than not, we believers are in need of a reminder. So MANA is doing that. MANA is taking on this campaign by way of saying that we are reminding we are reminding the believers in America with a particular objective, and that is to foster among the various segments of our Muslim communities a greater sense of appreciation of each other, a common sense of purpose, and a higher level of cooperation. With these three major objectives in mind, how do we go about trying to do this? First and foremost, the end of June, in, around June 27th, about 18 representatives of major national and, and regional organizations met for a day-long meeting in uh, uh, Long Island, hosted by the Islamic Center of Long Island uh, uh, for, for the purposes of helping us to form, formulate this campaign. And in doing so, we came up with these essentially three uh, 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 objectives, if you will, that we would promote dialogue, initiate youth activities across cultural lines, and first and, and finally facilitate joint projects. Now you know as well as I know that regardless of how much we attempt to do that, there are constant strains and stresses in the Muslim community that often pull us apart, either ar al around ideological lines, around, around theological lines, and worst of all, along ethnic or racial lines. So our purpose today is to spend for about the next 30 minutes or so to explore this topic to th think about this out loud and in more detail because MANA benefits from your input. MANA benefits from every outreach visit we make so that we hear from you, the supporters of MANA that can say to us, how about this? How about doing it differently? How about adding this to your program or to your campaign? And inshallah ta'ala we will do that. I'm joined today by two uh, esteemed panelists. To my far right is uh, uh, Sister Asma Hanif who presently serves as the chairwoman of the CCMO, which is the Coordinating Council of Muslim Organizations right here in the Washington, Maryland, and Virginia area. She is also the executive director of a group dedicated to helping Muslim women uh, entitled Muslimat al-Nisa, and by the way, their own fundraising dinner will be on September the 6th, the, the first weekend, uh, uh, the third weekend into Ramadan. To my right, immediate right, is Imam Shakir al-Sayyid, who presently serves as the Imam of Masjid Dar al-Hijra, which is across the Route 7 axis. So Route 7 East is Dar al-Hijra, and Route 7 West is the Adam Center where you are today. Imam Shakir al-Sayyid has for sure transcended and is an emblem of this uh, effort that we're talking about with healing and reconciliation. Not only is he an educator, he served as the director of, ed of the Education Department of the Islamic Society of North America, that in Indianapolis, then moved to Washington, D.C. Then he served there as the Secretary General of the Muslim American Society, and now presently serves as the Imam of Masjid Dar al-Hijra. So I'll begin by inviting Sister Asma Hanif to uh, uh, either, she can come here, she can speak from there. She wants to come? Okay. And then inshallah, she'll speak for about seven to 10 minutes, after which Imam Shakir will address you, and then we'll have a brief uh, comments and questions and answers. I give you Sister Asma Hanif. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. I wanted to speak about healing, reconciliation, forgiving, and the prevention of community separation. I'm so glad that um, Brother Ataf explained it because otherwise the things that I was going to say would not have made sense without his uh, preliminary information. I want to talk about memories. When we think of remembering the past, we're talking about stored memory. How we remember the past shape how we are in the present. 
if we are filled with grievances or issues that are unresolved, by definition, this hinders our ability to love and to forgive. Reconciliation is how to transform the collective and personal pain that any of us may have shared in our history into a community where we as its members can live together in some type of harmony. A community divided cannot thrive, cannot survive. I think about my memories in terms of since I've uh, accepted Islam. And if I was to express those to you, I would say, sister, you don't remember me, but I was the one who stood beside you in the Salat line in a masjid that I was unfamiliar with, and you moved away from me. And I kept wanting to get closer to you because I wanted to be able to close that gap, and you continued to move away from me, and I didn't understand. Sister, you may not remember me, but I was the one who had fasted during the month of Ramadan, and I was online to be able to get my plate because I was hungry as everyone else was there. But instead of filling my plate, you asked for the sister behind me who looked like you, who didn't look like me, and gave her the plate of food. You didn't understand what you had done. Sister, as I sat in a room filled with individuals who I didn't understand what you were talking about, you did not include me in your conversation, and I felt ostracized in a whole entire masjid of Muslims, those who say that they believe as I believe. But I can't stand before you on a panel about healing and reconciliation without saying to these sisters, because you don't remember me, but these are in my stored memory. And I say to you, sister, I forgive you. I forgive you because you didn't know what you were doing to me or the impact that it made in my life. And I forgive you because I need you. I forgive you because I need to. I need you because three days ago, a sister called me from Mississippi and she said, I am the victim of domestic violence. Sister Asma, I need to get to where you are. I said, I need someone along the path who can help this sister. The imam of the community there, whom I don't know, this sister whom I don't know, gave me a reference for this sister. And alhamdulillah, put this sister in a vehicle to be able to travel here. Yesterday, yesterday, the sister called me from Winchester, Virginia, and said her vehicle had broken down two hours away from her destination to me in Baltimore. I didn't know what to do. I didn't even know where Winchester, Virginia was. I called Brother Collett of Adams. I said, Brother Collett, I have a sister in Winchester, Virginia. She's trying to get here. Her vehicle broke down. She has three children. What can I do? He said, Sister Asma, let me get back to you. Let me help you. I called Brother Rizwan because he was also someone whose phone number I have. And I said, Brother Rizwan, this sister is there. I need a way to be able to get her. I do not want her stranded in the middle of the night. When I called Brother Khaled, I know he was sitting at his house, eating food with his family. But he took my call anyway. He didn't have to. He did. It was his connection with me in some kind of way as a Muslim that made this brother pick up the phone and say, I'm going to do whatever I can do to be able to help this sister. And from there, somebody on this network of Muslims got a tow truck to tow this sister to Sterling, Virginia. Someone on this network of Muslims got a vehicle to put this sister and her children in so that she could then follow her vehicle, so she couldn't leave it there because the gas station attendant said, she can't leave it here. Somebody on this network of Muslims who I don't know, whom I don't know, gave that sister refuge for the night. We're talking one phone call. 
Somebody who I don't know brought this sister somewhere around here, I can't even explain to you where, to be able to put brakes on this sister's vehicle, which is what happened, her brakes had failed. Somebody paid for those brakes to be able to be put on this sister's vehicle. And somebody made sure that this sister had enough gas in her vehicle to get to me. That sister is in our shelter right now because there were people along the way who I forgave, who were part of my community, who I needed to help a sister who I had never met before, an individual who I have no idea of who were involved. This is why we have to have healing and reconciliation because we need one another. This sister could not have made it here without our community from Mississippi to Baltimore, Maryland. She could not have made it here. And that's why I stand before you and I say, wherever those sisters were, on those times when they hurt me, I forgive them. Because had I not, I would not have been able to call Brother Collett, whom I met since I came here, or Brother Rizwan, whom I met since I came here, and trusted this sister and her three babies in the hands of individuals who I have no idea who they are. All I know is that we need one another. And alhamdulillah, because we have one another, this sister and her children are safe. Assalamu alaikum. Allahu Akbar, inshallah. Allahu Akbar, inshallah. Barakallah fikum, jazakallah khair, sister Asma Hanif. And uh, I, as I said in the beginning of this program, it is these kind of heartfelt conversations that will inshallah ta'ala begin to take place. They have already begin to take, begun to take place, but it is really truly the, the belief of manna that we all together can work and inshallah help to uh, 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 heal inshallah some of the wounds that may exist. And if not, if people didn't even know that they did something wrong, I remember growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, and, uh, and if uh, subhanAllah, he's still a, a brother dear to me, a, a brother by the name of Khalid Abdul Samad. And he was the one who helped raise us when we were young. I remember distinctly being at an Eid, uh, a Ramadan Eid uh, gathering. People don't think what they say sometimes, and children hear, and I was only about 11, 12 years old. And I was standing at the, close to the door, and Khalid Abdul Samad is a towering man of maybe about six feet three, six feet four. He was walking towards the door, and I heard one uncle say to the other uncle, who invited these people here? I remember at 13, at 12 or 13, being so wounded by that statement, so hurt that I stood at that door and I said, nobody will go past me until someone from here apologizes to this man who never even heard what you said, but I know what you said, and I know what you meant. So for me, that, that consciousness was awakened because of my parents, my father and mother, who transcended those lines and who never, who taught us that there were no such lines. And indeed, inshallah ta'ala, with the help of manna and with other such efforts, we will begin to do that and to really look for a better way, a better America, a better Muslim America, so that all of our children, inshallah, can grow up in that, in that uh, uh, shade. I will now invite Imam uh, uh, Shakir al Sayyid to share some of his reflections on the idea of working together to benefit this community. Imam Shakir al Sayyid. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am honored to be invited by MANA and be at Adam Center. It's always a pleasure. I feel that this is also an extension of our local community here. And we always welcome to see Adam's members coming to attend our activities as the Leisure members uh, showed up tonight, some of them. Uh, the issue of healing and reconciliation assumes that there are lots of wounds to be healed and assumes a journey to reconcile those differences and gaps and, and gulfs that we see between each other. I can tell you that the Quran tells us unless we heal our own individual hearts, we cannot join them together. You see how much the Quran speaks about unity and love and everything else? It all depends on the individual's own heart. 
So if I am comfortable as a person, I am likely to deal with others from a position of optimism, hope, and comfort, and as such, radiate those feelings into the people I'm talking with. If I'm agitated and irritated, if I'm always sad and depressed, it also reflects the way I communicate even with myself and definitely with my family. We need to ask more serious questions about the concept of healing because there is a wound that is deeper than the wound we may inflict on each other. That is the wound that we generate and create by claiming to be perfect Muslims when we know there is no such a thing as a perfect Muslim. We speak even about the muttaqeen as people who are more like angels than humans, very much contrary to what the Quran is saying to us. So we have concepts to fix before we can fix attitudes and approaches. We have more than superficial remarks to be made on that concept, healing and reconciliation. And I believe the depth of the issue is in everyone's heart. Everyone can talk from one's own position and put the wounds and the pains. And when we talk out of positions of pain, we end up inflicting pain on the audience as well. But when we take off positions of hope and optimism and charge everybody with the Quran, the Quran says something very simple. Do you want to heal wounds? Do you want to reconcile differences? I will leave you with just one ayah in the Quran. If that one ayah doesn't work, don't try healing and don't try reconciliation. The ayah says, Idfa' billati hiya ahsan. Respond in the better way. Answer in the better manner. I'm not yet at a point to discover what else could work if this one doesn't. And I'm not going to try to search. Even at home, when somebody, let us say the husband or the wife, one of them is angry, agitated, irritated, frustrated, and they reach out to the other, and the answer is in kind, not better, what does it do? It flares up the atmosphere. It doesn't heal. It hinders. So brothers and sisters, I don't have more minutes, do I? I don't. I don't. To tell you, and that's why I'm saying it is one verse. Remember the situations in which the Prophet ﷺ stood up, very tall, more than a giant, when people insulted him, when people mistreated him, when people injured him physically and psychologically and mentally, accusing him of being a liar, a deceiver, and all names in any bad book. But he stood taller than a giant to tell the angel of mountains, don't crush them. Even if they don't believe, I hope that their children will have a better chance to become believers even if they miss the train. How much love is this? Being fought by Khalid ibn al-Walid, talking about wounds, listen to the wound of the Prophet ﷺ. When he was personally injured, when Khalid stood on the other side in the battle of Uhud, the second battle of Muslims, and the only battle that they were wounded physically, and 70 of the bravest of their men were finished, were killed. 
After the battle, several years later, here is Khalid again added, preventing the Prophet ﷺ from entering into Mecca, not standing on his side with differences. He was standing on the other side with war. Do you know what the better answer the Prophet had for him? A simple message. After the Hudaybiyah Treaty, he sent a message to Khalid telling him, Khalid, we see that you are too smart to end up anywhere but in the fold of Islam. How many of us would command or commend their enemies after serious wounds and injuries have been personally inflicted on you and your family? How many? How many could overcome our pain? There is no healing if we continue to remember our pain. And there is no reconciliation unless we reconcile our claim of Islam and our real living Islam. Thank you very much. Takbir. Inshallah. And you can do your own takbirs. You don't have to wait for me. <laughs> Just to let you know. Um, uh, mashallah, Jazakallah khair, uh, Imam Shakir, for those words. Uh, I do want to tell you that as a part of this national healing and reconciliation campaign, what are some activities that you could help promote? So the task force of 18 members from around the country the thought of these five or six things that you personally could get involved with. First and foremost would be town hall meetings such as this one whereby the issue would be discussed and speakers would come and you would have an exchange of ideas as we're about to do. Secondly was to have uh, 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 dinner gatherings among smaller diverse groups and try to help people build over uh, a meeting and eating and, and, and relaxing. Pairing masajid, which if you remember last year, if you were here uh, for the MANA event at Adam Center, our beloved Imam uh, uh, Muhammad Majid, who is to the far left uh, sitting against the wall there, uh, had, had exactly recommended this, and the task force on its own came up with the same idea. He had talked about this notion of pairing, pairing masajid uh, from the inner city, from the suburbs, from the rural, from the, from the urban, all of that. And that's another, another thing the uh, task force recommended. Also having what's called the minbar exchange. The notion of having khatibs from different masajid coming and giving khutbahs at the different communities so that you could see the, 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 the beauty of Islam and the emphasis along the same lines of the same teachings but by different people. Also education programs and then a speaker's bureau whereby we would have people from different communities going to other communities and giving lectures on various topics. At this point, for the next uh, a few minutes, we would like to invite you, if you have any comments, any, any, any uh, uh, questions, any observations on the campaign, any recommendations for MANA, uh, anything you want to address to the two speakers, to my far right, uh, uh, Sister Asma Hanif, and to my immediate right, uh, Imam Shakir al Sayyid, we would welcome that, inshallah. Just identify yourself and uh, the, the masjid or the community you're from, so, just so we can hear uh, who you are. So we have a, a, a wireless mic, and the, uh, the only uh, um, c condition that you can hold this mic is if it's a question. So we, 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 can't, we don't have much time for another lecture, but if you have a question to ask, inshallah, we would uh, appreciate your uh, using that microphone to ask that question. Or even a, a comment, but a brief comment. Yes, there's a, there's a on this side. Um, My question to the community is, when are we going to open a shelter for the Muslim women in Virginia? Because we have 70,000 people, Muslims, in this area, and we don't have a single shelter. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. Um, that's a question that I'm asked a lot about opening shelters. And um, unfortunately, I would always respond by saying it's not as easy as, as you think. 
Um, most of us believe, may feel that it's just a matter of having a house and paying the rent and having some sisters to come there. But as someone who has been uh, in the midst of this task for uh, a year now, what you find is that sisters come with varying needs, all right, varying in, in, insecurities and emotional problems as a result of just being homeless in general. So I never recommend a person to just open a shelter. What I more so recommend is that individuals, just like with the MANA Project, you support a shelter that's already in existence. Even if the sisters have to come nationwide, it's better to do one, one shelter, excellent, and have it you know, fully financially supported with the type of counseling and help that is needed than it is to just open houses up all over, um, the, say, the nation. Before I did the shelter, I, what I realized was that um, I did research to find out why they fail. And one of the main reasons was financial support because it's very difficult to be able to get communities to give this type of money, as well as not having the type of uh, social workers or psychiatrists or the different things that people need. So I don't recommend, even though there is a need, it's cheaper, if I should say they're more cost effective, maybe I shouldn't say cheaper, but more cost effective for someone to send a sister from somewhere else to a place that's already stable than to um, give money and open up a place that, mashallah, will not be able to be stable enough to survive. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wa liyus salihin. Wa ashadu anna sayyidana wa nabiyana wa habibana Muhammad al-Rasulullah. خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ونبيك ورسولك الأمي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما عدد ما أحاط به علمك وخط به قلمك وأحصاه كتابك وارض اللهم عن ساداتنا أبي بكر وعمر وعثمان وعلي وعن الصحابة أجمعين وعن التابعين وتابعيهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين My dear beloved brothers and sisters in Islam I feel humbled to be invited for this honor of sharing a few humble thoughts with you knowing very well that amongst you there are many who are much more worthy to be in this position I thank them all, and I thank all the brothers and sisters of MANA, Adam Center, and all those who worked hard to bring us together in this blessed evening, inshallah. The topic that was assigned to me is to address the general theme of healing and reconciliation. And by the way, when we talk about healing, as my custom is, is to go to the Quran, look into the concordance, and we find that there are a few ayahs that deal with healing. And not surprisingly, at least one of them deals with physical healing, as it speaks about the benefits of honey. It is in that spirit, even though this is not the focus of this presentation, to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to complete the physical healing of my beloved brother and beloved brother for all of us, Imam Siraj Wahaj, inshallah. Now, standing in this position this evening, I'm not making any pretenses or claims. I'm standing only as a brother among many of yours. And one of the prerequisites and duties of brotherhood is to be frank and candid with one another, including engaging in self-criticism. Engaging in self-criticism not with the intention of pointing fingers, but with the intention of developing better understanding between us as an ummah more importantly, to inculcate in ourselves the proper attitude towards each other so that we may think how we can work together as members of the same ummah, the ummah 
of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this brings us to the theme, the basic theme of this evening, healing and reconciliation. The title to me signifies that there are wounds to be healed and that there are also differences to be reconciled. Wounds that might result from our imperfection as human beings, because as Muslims, we are not identical with Islam. It's a great blessing, of course, to be Muslims, but our behavior at times is un-Islamic. We may have many Muslim cultures, but this is not to be equated with the Islamic culture. For, in fact, to the shock of some, there are many un-Islamic Muslim cultures. I repeat, un-Islamic Muslim cultures. It's called Muslim cultures because it's common among Muslims, but being Islamic is a different issue altogether. Going back again to the title, as the word healing itself implies that there are wounds, the other word, reconciliation, also signifies that there are divisions or differences, some of which require reconciliation so that we can work together as one body for the benefit of all the, and the benefit of humanity even at large. But that in itself might raise another question. What are those entities that need that healing and reconciliation? Well, if you look at it in a more comprehensive manner, you could say that these entities include the individual, family, there are lots of pain also and wounds, reconciliation that's needed on the family level, so individual level, family, community, on the level of various organizations, reconciliation between people following different valid jurisprudential opinions or ishtihads, reconciliation between various people even within the same group, let alone between one group or organization and the other, reconciliation on the level of Muslims in a given nation, reconciliation between Muslims and their fellow citizens of other faith communities, reconciliation between Muslim countries, reconciliation between East, West, North, East. You can really deal with any of those levels as part of the total picture that would come under this title. These levels of healing and reconciliation are all important, but as, and they are actually in a way interrelated and interdependent. So even if you focus on one, let's not forget the total picture. But of course, with the time limits that we have for our meeting and for this presentation, I think there is some justification to focus largely on our perceived need for healing and reconciliation as an ummah here in North America, and more particularly, and let's be open about that, between two major important component of the ummah of North America, numerically and in terms of quality and importance. Uh, sometimes people use the term the immigrant Muslims or, and the indigenous Muslims. Well, I have my, uh, my reservation also about using those terms. And I've been in that position one time speaking uh, in one of the sessions, not the, of the Parliament of Canada, but sometimes the support, like the Congress also, some functions. So it was in, the, in that occasion where um, the speaker who was a former 
uh, leader of one of the parties of Canada, uh, speak about how the Canadians, like himself, are welcoming and try to accommodate the immigrant Muslims. After he finished his presentation, I expressed some views. I said that all of us here are immigrants. The only difference is that some immigrants came before the others. And that if the only people who are exempted from that perhaps would be the native Canadians. Uh, and even then, historians might say that some of them probably might immigrated when the continents were connected. So the term immigrant we use only in terms of relative recency in coming here. Yes, there are major differences also in this immigration, some of which was forceful immigration. We are all are aware of that. Some might have been optional. So, so natives also are indigenous. What does it take to be indigenous except only in relative terms? It just remind me with a little story when in the late 60s, I taught for one year in the University of Portland in Maine. And uh, that state apparently is super conservative and almost like anti any immigrant. And somebody from Maine who was telling me that story, he said that somebody immigrated to Maine, the state of Maine, when he was four years old with his parents. Allah granted him long life and he died at the age of 100 some. And when he was buried, somebody put a sign on his grave, here lies the stranger. <laughs> so if we're using those terms, perhaps, like I say, there could be all kind of meaning to them. I, I love the Islamic uh, term, in fact, like muhajireen and ansar, because it has a different connotation in meaning and connotation also historically speaking, that's much more positive than forced or choice immigration for that matter. But in any case, we need really to get into the heart of the matter without sensitivity. And we have to ask ourselves, what are the sources of those wounds or differences that need to be healed and or reconciled? One reason is that oftentimes we speak about brotherhood, Islamic brotherhood, which is a beautiful concept, no question. Yet the fault is not with the concept. The fault is squarely with us. We talk about brotherhood, but we don't really implement it and live up to it as we should. When some of us deal with the others with a sense of superiority, so I'm superior because I'm immigrant. I was born in a country that majority are Muslims. Or the opposite, I feel superior because I am indigenous. I was born here and my, some of my ancestors were born here. I am superior or I sense, get sense of superiority because I think, rightly or wrongly, that because I was raised in a Muslim country that I know better about Islam than others and deal others in some condescending type of manner, even though they could be in reality more knowledgeable than me. When somebody says or get the sense of false superiority because, well, I speak the language of the Quran and I can read it. And look at those guys who are just trying hard even to pronounce it. Forgetting that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the one who recites the Quran and he does it well, he has one reward, and the one who recites the Quran with difficulty, he gets two rewards. That is my understanding. One reward for reciting the Quran, one reward because he doesn't know the language and he's struggling and exerting greater effort to recite the book of Allah. On the other hand, you might also, and I'm very frank, and try to be impartial, somebody who might have a perceived sense of superiority because, well, I'm indigenous here, I know the environment here. I'm entitled to have my own understanding of Islam. I don't need any imported fatwa from anywhere. I need to define my own private American Islam. Another example of our failure to really live up to the demands 
of brotherhood. When we find in the same locality, metro area, for example, a number of immigrant relatively more affluent than many others, many are professionals, constructing fancy mosques and Islamic centers, costing millions. It's good if to have big centers so that you accommodate activities. I'm not critical of that, but what I'm critical of that in the very same time, in the very same locality, we, there is not enough to support the brothers and sisters who are less affluent, less fortunate, who live in the core of the city, trying even to build, let alone repair or keep going a modest masjid where there are lots of good going on and lots of good activities are taking place. We, as if we're living in two different worlds, two different Islams, the Islam of suburbs and the Islam of the core of downtown or other areas. A third example of that failure of brotherhood is when we find in many communities that they are endowed by the grace of Allah with, with a large number of Muslim doctors of all kinds of specialties. Some are doing that, but in many other places, there is no low-cost kind of clinic, if not, as some even would expect, some free clinics, even volunteering, a physician volunteering once a week to look after those who are less fortunate, especially in a country where the, uh, the cost of medical health insurance is beyond the means of many, where 47 million Americans do not have any basic uh, health insurance. And as a footnote, since this debate is going on, it puzzles me, not only in America, but all over the world, that the same bodies that authorize trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars in destruction of life are hesitant to authorize a fraction of that to maintain life and health of the community. It puzzles me. I might not be the only one, but perhaps I'm not. I can hear some reaction to this. Uh, this is not a political uh, advertisement. It's not being paid by Mr. Obama. Anyway, <laughs> these examples are only samples. Samples of many other issues that need to be addressed candidly, analyzed, and dealt with. Now coming to a final part, a longer part than the other ones, but bear with me, because I think that's, to me, the more important one. It is helpful to understand, of course, the dilemma, the wounds, and the differences that require healing and reconciliation. It is good to understand example where we failed, but we should not always focus on the negative. The issue here, where do we go from here? How do we deal with this? It would be too ambitious for anyone to have a pretense, at least for me, to say, all right, now here is the formula and the guideline. You do X, Y, and Z. All I can hope to do in the remaining few minutes, inshallah, is not to suggest even solutions, not even broad solutions, but humbly suggested framework within which solutions on the broad level or specifically on the ground can be considered because it is a lot of work to really go from top down until you really reach the field itself and become more specific and concrete. And I'd humbly suggest that there are three basic guidelines or pillars, pillars of the framework of beginning the process of solution. The first pillar is purification, tazkiyah. Purifying our hearts, examining our intentions. Let each and every one of us, leaders and followers alike, ask themselves constantly, ceaselessly, is my intention truly to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and win paradise? 
is my niyyah, and we are all humans have weakness, but how far is my niyyah tarnished somehow by the desire to get any benefit for myself? Material, leadership, loyalty of others. Is my loyalty essentially to one group, organization, ethnic group, linguistic group, this or that? Or is my loyalty above all to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which provide the underpinning, if not the very foundation and the framework that I could have derived loyalty. There is no problem having loyalties, but it has to be derived above all from loyalty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has to be based upon it, and it cannot violate this list of priorities. Does my intention or is my intention blemished somehow with some sense of pride on the basis of ethnicity, language, nationalism? And again, when some people say, new Muslim. What is new Muslim? Everybody is born Muslim. New revert, not convert, revert, coming back to the nature of Islam. Even if we take it in terms of how many years a person has uh, been a Muslim or somebody who was born a Muslim since he was a baby versus someone who embraced Islam even in his 90s. Let's remember, we don't have a union seniority rosters by mere employment. Even in unions, seniority is not always by the amount of service, but also there could be seniority by different criteria as well. It's not always that the date of employment, as some of you in business who are, are aware of this. What does it mean? A person who is, whose Islam goes back to five days, few days, may be more enthusiastic, more sincere, and might be more knowledgeable even than someone who says, oh, I've got 60 years behind me of Islam. Seniority roster, I should be first. You know, what do we mean by that? And that's the issue that we really need to answer for ourselves before ask, asking anyone else to answer for us. I started with that particular pillar. Even though on the surface it might sound remote or irrelevant, but no, not really. Without this tazkiyah or this self-purification, we would not succeed to inculcate in ourselves the true Islamic attitude. Without that base or pillar, any amount of knowledge would lose its true guiding light. And without that base, the blessings in our effort and work could be voided or at least diminished. The second pillar is to have the correct understanding of the true beautiful message of Islam from its true original sources, the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet On the basis of this, we can evaluate our cultural baggage, our cultural heritage as Muslims. Not to throw it away, not to worship it, but to classify and discern the type of those cultural baggages, some of which we should be proud of, the cultural practices that are not Muslim cultures, but truly Islamic culture, meaning based on Islamic concept, prompted and encouraged by Islam, such as cleanliness, hospitality, and so on. That's fine. We should be proud of this. We have to realize that there may be other cultural practices. So this one, for that category, embrace it. Embrace it fully. Then there is a second category of cultural practices, which falls in the area of permissible. It's not required. It's not mustahab, desirable. It is not makru, detestable, or haram. It's simply mubah, allowed, permissible. We don't have to have one. We could have diversity for that category. Tolerate it. First one, embrace it. Second one, tolerate it, live with it. More than tolerate, accept it, because sometimes tolerance also might have some condescending meaning in the mind of some. Accept it, accept at least that diversity. 
But then there is a third category of cultural practices that goes against Islam, and some people, including Muslims, think it's Islamic, which is not, once you test it on the true sources of Islam. What do we do with that category? Reject it. So one category, embrace it. One category, accept it, live with it. Other category, reject it. You reject it not because you're rejecting your heritage. There's nothing wrong with that. You're rejecting anything that is un-Islamic and falsely attributed to the teaching of Islam. We have also to develop our clear vision and understanding of at least the concept that relate more directly to our topic here as an ummah, part of one ummah that want to get together and work hand in hand. That is part also of understanding. I'll just summarize five points or so very quickly. One, to realize that true brotherhood is a characteristic of believers according to the Quran. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً True believers, true between brackets, believers are one brotherhood, so iman. And brotherhood is not just a politically correct statement or just pretense. It goes deeper to the very basis of our iman. And one clear sign of that iman, as the Prophet ﷺ explained, and you hibb al mar'a la yuhibbuhu illa lillah, that you love a brother or sister in Islam for no reason except for the sake of Allah. This is that the love between me and Brother Siraj, which he expressed and I did express in several occasions and several lectures. What is really common between us? It is the bond of Iman, the bond, the bond of loving each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the same apply, mashallah, to a dear brother, Imam Qasim, that I had the privilege to know him recently, but he's just struck a chord in my heart and I felt the same also on his part. That's, by the way, this is not uh, something to please either of those guys. You know, the Prophet ﷺ said that, actually. Al-Arwahu, Junudun Mujannada, he says the spirits of Muslims are like, you know, they can recognize one another. It says if one believer came to a place where there is a 100 hypocrite and one believer, he will go to the believer, strike accord with him. And the opposite also is true. So it's, it's not, it's, it's reality. We, we experienced, we know it. And alhamdulillah, it is a great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to realize, secondly, that one of the conditions of this brotherhood is not just good, good feeling, but standing up for our brothers and sisters. As the Prophet ﷺ made it clear, the believer, or the Muslim, is a brother unto other Muslims. Of course, the Quran also speaks about brotherhood on a broader level, but we're talking about within the scope of the ummah. La who does not oppress him, and of course him means or her, does not oppress him, does not let him down, does not forsake him. And here I stop and wonder, how are we faring as Muslims on various levels when not only are we failing to stand by those who are hungry, in need, oppressed, suffering all kind of uh, strangulation in terms of even food and medicine. And what are those so-called leaders of the Muslim Ummah doing? Snoring in their sleep, failing to take up their responsibility, and shamefully, some of them are helping those who are murdering, killing, and uh, slowly starv starving their brother and sisters. And we talk about, oh, we're brothers, we're all brothers. Yeah, alhamdulillah. What, what, what is this type of brotherhood? Brotherhood has its requirement in action, not only in good feeling or good attitude. When we deal with each other in any condescending manner, we forget what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, بحسب امرئ من الشر أن يحقر أخاه المسلم. Enough evil for a believer to, you know, downgrade or belittle his or her Muslim brother. Before I move to the third point, one of the requirements also of the believers, and I love that in the the plan of the manna, uh, you know, planning committee, I loved it. 
I knew the hadith, but I learned. I always learn from my brothers and sisters of all ages. I always learn. I, I find it very interesting to be open. The hadith that we, they quoted, I know it very well. And all of you know it, don't you? When the Prophet ﷺ likens the ummah is like one body. If one part of the body aches, the other body, you know, aches with it. Exactly. And uh, two things I learned. One is that if you look at the various organs of the body, they're not all the same. Imagine all your body are eyes or hands, like oct octopus, <laughs> you know. They're different. They feel different. They, you know, they do different functions. That's okay. That's part of the diversity, not diversity between people and nations and tribes. Diversity within even the same body, right? Yet, they're all working together to achieve the health of the body. The other point I loved in the statement, that when it's the hadith say, if one part aches, the whole body aches with it, which actually implies that special attention should be given to those who are hurting. The wives that are abused, and the husbands sometimes who are also abused, with a, a karate-trained wife. Who <laughs> there are, but of course, let's, let's say, for the sake of justice, it is more so the other way around. That's the part that is heard that need we, we need to look at. If we look at various groups of Muslims, economic, social, and others, it is actually those who are not as fortunate, who have suffered years, not years, decades, in one sense, centuries even, of oppression and deprivation that we really should pay attention because the part that aches more, that means it needs more attention. It's not everything equal, equitable, yes. Just and justice does not mean equality. It means more attention when it's needed. Just like when you're sick. I mean, if, you're, if, you're, if you have, Allah forbid, some pain in your eyes, you don't say, all right, I'll do something for my eye and my feet. Your feet are okay. Your hands are okay. Your ears are okay. All your attention, imagine a splinter in your eye, just a little splinter. All your attention would direct, be directed to that. You say, no, equally also, let me look at my ears, how, how I hear. You really pay attention to the part that is hurting more. I love that. A third issue is to realize that the Quran and Sunnah mandates unity. Mandates unity and consider any person, anywhere in the world who says La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah as equally, equally a member of the Muslim Ummah irrespective of any other false barriers. In fact, it is not only because it's mandated in the Quran, it is logical also. If you look at the pillars and foundation of unity in Islam, you find it much more profound than any other faith communities. I know other faith communities have also basis for unity. But look at the unity in Islam, and that could be a whole topic by itself, just listing them. They all believe in the same one God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not much debate do we have about Allah and how Allah relates to us and what is his nature and all of this, this the, the aqeedah of Islam about Tawheed is so crystal clear. And that's what one of the biggest attractions, not only to those who don't know about Allah enough, but even those who knew about Allah and find in Islam a much better and truthful explanation. That unites all Muslims. How many Muslims have differing belief about Allah? It's all uniting force. We all believe in one prophet, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not excluding other prophets. We believe in him because he embodies all that was good and righteous and truthful in the teaching of all of the prophets. So we have a reference person described in the Quran as the best example of us, as a role model of what the best human behavior could be by anyone. There is no disagreement. Nobody says, I follow Muhammad Sallallahu Somebody says, no, but I follow Uthman or this. The Prophet Sallallahu is the ultimate role model for all of us. Thirdly, we all believe in one Quran. Many translations, but this is not translations of the Quran, many translations, interpretive, interpretation or interpretive translation of the meaning of the Quran. But we still have the original Quran. One Quran, 
So those who say there are versions in the Quran like other scripture are wrong. Versions mean something different. Additional book, deleted books, dispute about contents. There is nothing like this in the Quran, A to Z. Why? Not only because it is from Allah and there is ample evidence it is from Allah, but because Allah himself took care and responsibility of preserving it, as we find in Surah Al-Hijr, the ninth ayah. إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظٍ Allah says it's we who reveal this reminder. In the Quran, it's called dhikr, also like the book of Musa. Dhikr, but in the context here is the Quran. And it is we, me and Allah, who are going to preserve it. And alhamdulillah, that's different. That's different from any previous scripture. Because when the Quran speak about scripture in the past, prior to the Quran, it, it's, he, he say, it says that it entrusted its preservation to, to the people, the clergy, and so on. And trust, entrusting humans, uh, no matter how you know, they work hard, is not like Allah himself doing it. Human being can fall, can have shortcomings, but not when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserves it himself. Any difference in that? There is no difference. Where else do you find such a unifying force? As Muslims, we have also ultimate objective, ultimate objective, regardless of our detailed priorities, to reach the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to meet together, inshallah, in Jannah. As Muslims, we not only have the same uh, privileges, but we have also the same challenges facing us, the same opportunities, in essence, and the same dangers also for those, as the Quran described, who desire to extinguish the light of Allah and the Quran say they will never be successful in doing so. What, what, what is the relevance here of madhab or uh, color or race when it comes to the essential core issue of being Muslim or not, whether Islam survives or not? And we know for sure, according to the promise of Allah, it will survive in spite of all of those difficulties. Fourthly, to realize that diversity and plurality is not always negative. There may be some element of it that might be negative, but in fact, this diversity, according to the Quran, is beneficial and could be very enriching. If you go to the ayah in Surah Al-Hujrat, the famous 13th ayah, Allah created us into nation that tribes and so on to get to know one another. If you did in Surah Al-Rum, the 30th surah in the Quran, of the signs of Allah is the creation of heavens and earth and the diversity of your languages and your complexion. It's mentioned as a barakah. Even diversity in religious conviction, even though it's, you know, there's only one true path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know that. But even that is a reality that we should not interfere with. As Allah says, if Allah willed, all people on earth would have been one ummah. In another ayah, all people would have been believers. So to live with that reality, let alone just within the Muslims, the diversity, and differing backgrounds, differing madhab, differing way of thinking should not be a reason for division. It could be actually enriching. We can discuss, argue, can keep your opinion. I respect you. You respect my opinion. So long we're all basing our understanding on legitimate interpretation based on uh, scholarly uh, grounds or at least reference to qualified uh, scholars. Fifthly, that we have to understand and be conscious that when we speak about vision and priorities, I know it is easier sometimes to say, and it may be to some extent true, that we say that part of our diversity is that we have differing priorities. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. However, I beg to have just a little bit of qualifier for that. Why? Because I believe that when we speak about pr priorities in the broader sense, as an ummah, is it more important now to argue about the length of the beard or to look at the basic uh, death and destruction that is being wreaked on Muslims in different parts of the world? So that as a broad priority should be acceptable and general among all. But that does not say that when we come to specifics, that we do have differing priority. And in the past, having observed MSA evolving into ISNA and now, you know, all the variety of organizations, that oftentimes the immigrant Muslims 
are not totally aware of what, for example, the African-American Muslims have gone through and is going through. So the kind of attention and topics and issues that you find in Jum'ah are addressed by immigrant Muslims might be far away from the kind of interest and day-to-day -day problems, all kinds of problems that the other community is encountering day in and day out. I'm not saying because some people are not sympathetic, that some might be, but maybe because they have not gone through that experience. You can hear all lectures all night, but not until you live it, then you can really appreciate it. The experiential element of it is not there. It is in that sense then that when, for example, uh, a great imam, a, a beloved brother above all to me, like Imam Siraj, uh, you know, led the effort to purify the area around at taqwa Masjid from drug dealers and so on. Maybe the, the Muslims living in the suburb perhaps cannot per conceive even of what the drugs, they might not know even what drugs except what they prescribe to them. <laughs> in the, in the far, you know, so uh, I, this is the issue, like I say, in that sense, in specific areas, the priorities might be different. However, even if we have different priorities, specific priorities, we should all have one unified vision. We can have priorities, that's useful, that's fine. People with more expertise in some area, they can address, the others can support them because they know more about these specific problems, but we should have one vision. And we have to realize that the Quran invites us all, it's not a politically correct thing to say unite, unite. We hear it a lot. When the Quran speaks about unity, it presents it as a command and warn us about violating that command. As a command when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Hold tight, all of you, not some of you or a group of you or privileged group, no. Hold all of you tight to the rope of Allah and be not divided. But there are consequences for that division and the Quran also give us this warning. وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا فَتَفْشَلُوا وَتَذْهَبَ رِيحُكُمْ وَاصْبِرُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الصَّبْرِينَ Don't get into disputation. Differing opinion, fine. Debate it, fine. But disputation is different. Tanazu, you know, hating each other because we differ in opinion or this or that. No. Because the consequence it says, فَتَفْشَلُوا You will fail and your strength will be gone. The third and last pillar, that's a shorter one. You know why shorter? Because once we establish the proper niyyah and self-purification, once we join that with proper knowledge, we are ready to move a step further in our frame of reference for solution. That is to translate that sincerity and translate and be guided by the light of that knowledge as to how we can work with each other in the reality, on the ground, not in the ivory towers, on the ground. And that really would be the acid test. For that, we need to be clear about the vision and how it relates to our ultimate objective of this life and beyond. We have to identify that. We need to work out together brainstorm about a general strategy as to how we could possibly navigate our way in our complex world, which is not always positive in our pursuit. Once this is determined, then we have to develop plans, specific plans and sub goals so that you can keep moving in a gradual uh, uh, manner. What, what are our plans? Ask. Muslim communities, anyway. What's your short-term plan? Everybody can tell you. Oh, inshallah, next year we'll make expansion, we'll make a parking lot. Okay, short-term. How about medium-term plan? How about long-term plan beyond us even when we're gone? Do we have any notion of that? This is something that's badly needed by us. We need all those stages to be set clearly. We need to ask ourselves what kind of resources, human resources, financial and others, are crucially needed in order to implement those plans. We need to have a mechanism, built-in, constant mechanism, to get feedback, evaluate and re-evaluate and correct our path as we learn more and more from experience. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
أن يزكي نفوسنا اللهم آتِ نفوسنا تقواها وزكِّها أنت خير من زكَّاها أنت وليها ومولاها Translation يا الله We ask you to purify our souls and to give it its uh, taqwa, the, the sense of uh, connection and conscious of your presence. Not Allah Ta'ala and you alimana ma yanfa'na wa yanfa'na bima alimana wa yazidana ilma. We pray to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala to teach us what is beneficial to us and make us benefit from what we learn and increase us in authentic knowledge. Nadu Allah Ta'ala an yuwafiqana ila amal al-khayri wa khayr al-amal. We ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala to guide us to do good and to do the best when we do that good. Nadu Allah Ta'ala an yajma'ana ala al-khayri wa al-huda wa al-tuqa wa an yataqabbala minna salih al-a'mal wa an yajma'ana jami'an ala hawd al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to join us all in goodness, in guidance, in piety, to accept good deeds from us, meager as they may be, and to join us ultimately around the pond of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in paradise. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasulu amma ba'd. Brothers and sisters, I'm very thankful to be here. My beloved Dr. Jamal Badawi, whom I love so much. And you cannot even begin to imagine how much I love you. And I, I could say that um, I had, I was blessed, I don't know how many years ago, maybe 20 years ago, uh, I counted one of the greatest blessings in my life when Sheikh Jamal Badri spent the night in my home. And we will never forget it, inshallah. Thank you so much. I want to take a few moments to talk about, about this issue of healing and re reconciliation. We do need healing and reconciliation, but that's not ultimately what we're talking about tonight. There are a couple of things that happened in my life that I am very, very proud of. One of them, a prominent non-Muslim lawyer in New York City, well-known, came to me. And he said, Imam Siraj, I need your advice. I have a father who left me and my family and my mother when I was four years old. Never took care of us. And I hated him. I just learned that uh, he's in the hospital and I don't want to go see him. But I respect you, Imam. Tell me what should I do? I said, don't even hesitate. That's your father. And no matter what your father did to you years ago, you go to that hospital and you go visit your father. He said, hey, ma'am, thank you for the advice. A week later, I had traveled. I came back. He came to me and said, hey, ma'am, Siraj, I want to thank you because I took your advice. And I went to go see my father after years, and now we have reconciled. We had a case of a sister in my community, a, a family. I adopted young sister. I kind of adopted the family. I, I loved them and would give them extra time. And uh, she got married to a brother in Syracuse. And it didn't work out, and she said she wanted to get a divorce. She said, Imam, I, I don't like him. And I told her that I saw so much good in this young man. And I, I think you should try to work it out. She said, no, I don't want to work it out. And we did this for weeks. And finally, she decided to give it a try. And that was a couple of years ago. And her and her husband always called me and thanked me for trying 
and bringing them together and helping them to reconcile. Now one I want to talk about, which is the most important, as Dr. Jamal said, the last. And again, I, this is not, a, it's not something public, but I think you should hear it. I think it's important. It will give us some lessons about this topic of, uh, of uh, healing and reconciliation. How many of you know that I once was a minister in the nation of Islam? Okay. How many of you know that I was once an imam under the leadership of Imam Waratuddin Muhammad? Most people don't know. By the time most of you knew me, I was an independent imam over Masjid Taqwa. That's all you know about. But you don't know about Imam Siraj as an imam in the world community of Islam in the West under the leadership of Imam Warathadi Muhammad. And, and what I'm going to say, I believe it. I believe that anything of good that I do, that Imam Warathadi Muhammad will get credit from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for any good that I do, and I'm going to tell you why. In 19, uh, let, me, let me back up first. 1975, I was a minister in the nation of Islam, and I'll never forget the day that Elijah Muhammad died. And you have to remember the theology of the nation of Islam. Imam Qasim was also a minister in the nation of Islam. We had erroneously believed at that time that Elijah Muhammad was the messenger of Allah. It's what we believed. We believed that there was a man named Father Muhammad. We believed that he was God. And we prayed, yes, we prayed, but we never made salat. We didn't make sajda and ruku. We didn't recite the Quran. We didn't face the Qibla. We stood up in the east and we raised our hand and that was our prayer. We didn't make pilgrimage to Mecca. So in 1975, when Elijah Muhammad died, his son, Imam Warathadi Muhammad, took over the movement. And he slowly began to unravel the teachings of his father. And he told us within the first year that Father Muhammad is not God that Allah is the creator of the heavens and the earth, and when you pray, you pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said that my father, Elijah Muhammad, is not a messenger of Allah. Prophet Muhammad is the last messenger of Allah, and there's no prophet after him. And then he brought uh, imams and scholars in our community, and he instructed them to teach us how to pray. We began to face the Qibla like the rest of the Muslims. We learned how to pray. Within the first year, Imam Waratuddin Muhammad took a whole uh, a large number of his followers to Mecca to make pilgrimage. In the nation of Islam, we used to fast not during the month of Ramadan, but we fasted in the month of December. It was Imam Waratuddin Muhammad said, no, we fast Shahr Ramadan in the month of Ramadan. So one of the greatest mass conversions ever took place under the leadership of Imam Waratudi Muhammad, and I was one of them that was blessed to turn my heart around and then begun, begin to practice Islam. And I believe any good that I do that Imam Waratudi Muhammad would get some of the credit. You said, but Imam, you said that you were once part of his community. Why did you leave? I credit Imam Waratuddin Muhammad for turning my heart to the Quran. I remember one of the teachers that he brought to us was Sheikh Jafar Idris from Sudan. And one day we were in Harlem, and about 25 of his Imams were there, and Sheikh Jafar recited some verses from the Quran, maybe 10 or 12 verses. And we taped it. And that was my first experience of hearing the Quran. You can hear my words on the tape 
saying that's the most beautiful thing that I've ever heard in my life. I have to learn that. And it was there that I began to learn to love the Quran. Imam Muhammad pointed my heart to the Quran to such a degree that I love the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, so much that I had a nickname in the community of Imam Warathuddin Muhammad. They said Imam Saraj Wahaj, the Sunni Muslim Imam in the world community of Islam in the West. That was my nickname. And I learned and I loved the Quran. And as I began to read the Quran and to love the Quran and love Allah and love the messenger, I began to see what I thought was contradictions. So I would write Imam Warathuddin Muhammad, I wrote him letters and I wrote him a 30 page letter, not in any mean spirited way, asking my teacher, help me to understand this. 1978, some of the Imams of Imam Warathuddin Muhammad was blessed to go to Naperville, Illinois for a 40 day Imam training program. There were 100 Imams there. I was blessed to be one of five to be chosen to continue my Imam training in Mecca. And I went to my leader, Imam Warathuddin Muhammad. I said, Imam, I was chosen to go to Mecca to study. I was his imam over Masjid in Brooklyn, Masjid Muhammad, Masjid 7C. And I said, Imam, I would love to go. If you tell me that I can't go, I won't go. But I want to go. I really want to go. And Imam Muhammad said, go ahead. When I went to Mecca, Allah blessed me. It was a life altering experience it changed my life. I learned so much. I grew so much. Lo lo loved, loved the Quran. And as I was there in Mecca, I was thinking about going back. When I go back to America, how I was going to work harder for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then I noticed this. When I would prepare my khutbahs for Friday, I would write verses from the Quran and hadith and then I said, I have to say something about Imam Muhammad. I, I noticed that I was drifting away from the teachings of Imam Warathani Muhammad. I'm not saying anything bad about him, but where my heart was, my heart was Quran and Sunnah. That's what I wanted. I didn't want nothing else. And then I began to teach everything that I learned in Mecca. I taught there in the masjid. And then I noticed that there was beginning to be a, a division in the masjid. I noticed it. Therefore, I called Chicago and I said, I have to speak to Imam Muhammad. I have to come there to Chicago to speak to Imam Muhammad. And the secretary told me that Imam, the Imam, Imam can't see you this week. I called back and said that, please let the Imam know that I'm coming to Chicago and I will not leave until I see the Imam. He called me back and said, the Imam said he will see you Friday. That Friday, I'll never forget, Imam Warathuddin Muhammad did the Jummah Khutbah in Chicago. And after, the, after the, the Khutbah, he saw me in his office and I said, Imam, I thank you for everything that you've done for me. You put me on the right path. But I have divided your community. I am responsible for have divided your community. For I'm not teaching your teachings. He said, well, what is it, Imam? And I began to tell the Imam, the differences, how I understood the Quran and soon I won't go into details, but he told me, Imam, it's okay. You can have these differences and still be my Imam. And I said, Imam, I can't. I, I don't have the conviction to do it. So Imam Muhammad, I said, how should I do it? He said, well, you go to the community and you let them know, do it in a good way. And then he came to New York the day that I resigned, he was there and he spoke. I spoke and he spoke. And he said, some of you thought that you would have a fight here, but I'm letting you know that Imam Siraj has done an honorable thing. What he has done is honorable. There were some people there, many people, it's taped. And then that day, it just so happened to be July 4th weekend. 
and the first of Ramadan, all in one. Now, about a year after that, in the khutbah, I said some unkind things about Imam Wardi Muhammad I should not have said. I have regretted it. This is some 30, 31, 32 years ago. After that, I begin, as I begin to study more and go around the world, I would always make sure every week that I would get a copy of the paper, the uh, Bilalian News and the, uh, the journey, the Muslim Journal, and, and I would read every week to always monitor the community, to see where the community was going, always, because my heart was always there. My heart never left the community. And even though one day I said some unkind things about Imam Muhammad, I still loved him and I loved the community. Then, all of a sudden, I start to say good and positive things about Imam Muhammad. If you go and listen to my talks the last 10 to 13 years, I've been saying good things about Imam Muhammad, things that you've heard about others in around the world, talking about the good that he's done. And last year, we were in Atlanta, Georgia, and it was an ICNA conference. And Imam Muhammad was scheduled to come the next day. And I spoke the day before. And I said, brothers and sisters, you don't know this man. You don't know the great work that this man has done. And I began to talk about the good work of Imam Waruthuddin Muhammad. The next day, the president of ICNA, at that time, Krishid Khan, Imam Muhammad came. And I was standing next to Imam, uh, brother Krishid Khan, and Kashid Khan said, Imam Wadhudi Muhammad, you should have heard Imam Suraj yesterday talking about you, talking about what great work you have done. And then Imam Muhammad said, yes, Imam Suraj Wahaj has grown, and so have I. When we formulated manna, the first one we went to was Imam Wadhudi Muhammad. He put it in his newspaper the next week. I wanted to tell him, to explain to him what we were doing. Now when Altaf said, he mentioned that June 27th in the Islamic Center of Long Island in Westbury, we had a meeting, 15 people were invited, uh, 18 people were invited, but 15 came. One of the people that came was Layla Muhammad, the daughter of Imam Waratuddin Muhammad. And we thought, that it was important that as we begin to move and do our work, that we would work with everybody. And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. You talking about reconciliation? Me and Imam Muhammad reconciled years ago. I would call him on his phone. Some of his followers don't, know, don't even know this. I would call him on the phone seeking advice from him. We would talk. I loved Imam Muhammad. I told him and he told me. So we reconciled where we were in the division. Traditionally, historically, there had been a divide between the other uh, in, indigenous, not you messed me up now, Dr. Jamal. I don't know what to say anymore. Ah, uh, you messed me up. I used to say indigenous, I can't say indigenous. I say immigrant, I can't say immigrant. You messed me up, man. There have been a, a kind of divide between the other so-called Sunni Muslim African Americans and the followers of Imam Wadhudi Muhammad. And I think it's because uh, you know, of where we came from, the nation of Islam, and our evolution. And a lot of the other Sunni Muslims didn't appreciate the growth and development or even understand what Imam Muhammad, where he was coming from. But if you study, really, Imam Muhammad way ahead of many people, and one of the things you have to say about him, this, I can say a lot of things about him. One of the things that you can say about Imam Wadhudi Muhammad is that he has a great love for the people. Not just Muslims, but not Jews and Christians. And he worked with everybody. And he loved everybody. He tried to work with everybody. So alhamdulillah, this reconciliation happened between myself, Imam Wadhudi Muhammad, and a lot of groups of Muslims who never appreciated. And I think that one of my jobs was to be a bridge 
Even though I was in the community, I left the community. I think ultimately one of my jobs was to become a bridge between the communities and let people appreciate the work of Imam Waruzadim Muhammad. Now, having said that, we have issues, but our issues that we have is, doesn't necessarily require healing and uh, reconciliation. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Sister Deja, you can help me with the date, I'm not sure. I think around 1975 or 76 was a shootout between two masjids. Dar, Dar, that's what, that was your masjid, right? Dar al Salam and, and Masjid of Islamic Brotherhood, MIB. What? Huh? Yasin Masjid, yes. What year was that? About 75. These communities, Muslims, had a shootout that resulted in the death of four people, two on each side. And there was hatred between them for years. And just now, they're beginning to reconcile. I don't need to reconcile with Dr. Jamal Badawi. That, that Dr. Uh, uh, um, Shakir, I say it. You mentioned something that Jamal didn't hear when you spoke before Dr. Jamal came. He said the same thing that you said. You said that uh, healing uh, presupposes wounds or something like that. We never had wounds. Al I, I ain't had no wounds with you, man. I'm not stupid, right? We, we ain't had. We know. You know. Ain't. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, so we have another issue. Let me tell you, I'm going to tell you a real wound. Let me tell you a real wound is. I was in South Africa both during apartheid and after. During apartheid, I went my first trip. i never forget. Brother was driving me. We were on our way um, from Johannesburg to Durban. About 2 o'clock in the morning, he ran out of gas in the middle of the road. I said, I quote, I came here to die. They're going to kill me. You know why I say that? Because I spoke against those folks. Let me say how Allah is. Let me say Allah is great. Let me say how Allah is, right? See, Allah will call you. He'll call you a bluff. I don't know if you, any of you from New York, do you remember I think it was 1986, Howard Beach. Howard Beach. There was a young man named Michael Griffith, 23 years old. Three African Americans went into that neighborhood. And some white folks chased them because they were black. And one of the guys, African American, Michael Griffith, ran across the highway, and as a result, a car struck him and he died. And three, four people were charged, three of them went to jail. And one day, I, I used to go past that area every day, right? And one day, I was driving, wallahi, I said this was in Howard Beach, and I said to myself, shoot man, I ain't running. If they come after me, I'm gonna stand there and fight. Wallahi, the moment I said that, my car stopped. I said, okay, Allah, I got the lesson. <laughs> you can start the car again. <laughs> Allah tests you. Allah tests you. You talk, Allah tests you. But in South Africa, the apartheid and how, African uh, how Africans were treated, blacks were treated there. One of the great heroes that everybody talk about now, Nelson Mandela, 26 years in prison. 26 years. And when he came out of prison, you would have thought he would be bitter. But he wasn't bitter. Two years later, he wins the Nobel Peace Prize. Two years after that, he becomes the president of South Africa. And then he goes all over the world 
getting great respect, and he never got bitter. Muslims are never bitter. You know, I used to work, Dr. Jamal, I used to work in a mental health clinic, and I had a supervisor, a Christian named uh, Dr. Stevenson. And one day, Dr. Stevenson said to me, oh, Suraj, you know, I, I, I finally figured out why you Muslims, you're never happy. You know, Muslims don't smile. He said, because I just realized, I just found out that Muslims only have two holidays. <laughs> we, got a lot of we got a lot of holidays and we always happy. Muslims are never happy. Now, I, I, I beg to differ with you. Muslims are happy. Muslim, I mean, brothers and sisters, if you understood the sunnah of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, you'd be smiling all the time. I remember, you remember Al Isra al Mi'raj when the Prophet went, went to Jerusalem and then he went to the heavens? He said to Jibreel, alayhi salat wa salam, I noticed that everybody I met gave me the greetings and smiled at me except for one. And Jibreel said, That was Malik, the angel of the hellfire. He has never smiled since Allah created him. And if he were to, were to smile, he would smile at you. So we should be people that smile. You know, you do, you know, you too. Ugh. Now, brothers and sisters, let me try to wrap it up. So we don't, we don't fight each other. We don't blood each other's nose. We don't shoot at each other. We don't need that kind of healing. We need something else. And what I think we need is, is one of the great blessings that I, that I got during my sickness. I'm telling, you, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you're not going to believe what I'm saying. You're going to think I'm making it up. Wallahi. You know Allah said in Quran, وَذْكُرُوا نِعْمُتُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ وَذْكُرُوا نِعْمُتُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ Remember Allah's favor on you, right? And and if you try to count Allah's blessings, you'll never be able to count them. Wallahi, one of the greatest blessings I ever got in my life when Allah gave me cancer. Wallahi. He said, no, Imam, you're crazy. I'm not crazy. You see, no one acts to be sick. But when you get it and you depend upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will give you brothers and sisters blessings that you can't even begin to perceive. Every kind of, I can write a book on all the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me as a result of being sick. And all of us, because Muslims have the right attitude. We have the right attitude. We can be like Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, when he goes and he conquers Mecca. He can say what Yusuf said, alayhi salat wa salam. There's no, no, there's no uh, huh, blame on any of you. May Allah forgive you this day. This is the way Muslims are. We, we are forgiven to one another. But there's something else we have, we have, we need. And this is what I learned on my sick bed, and that is sensitivity. Sensitive to people. I'm sensitive now, brothers and sisters, more than I've ever been before to everybody. There's a Christian, there was a Christian uh, with cancer named Dobbs, a white man. I used to talk to him every day and try to encourage him. His family would come all, every day, he brought someone from the family, and they all knew about me. Every one of them. Because when I went there, I talked to them, I, I loved them, I, I, I feel for them. I feel for all the Muslims. They're Muslims, some of you brothers and sisters don't even know it, there's Muslims with AIDS. Right in your community. You don't know them. I know them. Now what do you do? you the imam of the masjid. And the brother comes to you, Sheikh. And they say, I got AIDS, but I want to get married. I want to get married. What do you do? Well, we have a group of Muslims living with AIDS. Should we not introduce them to one another? I got that from Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. In my conclusion, I'm finished. This is it. I, I got it. I got it now. It's sensitivity. It's, it's concern. It's Mutual love and mutual respect for everybody. I, every Muslim, it doesn't matter, the males and the females, the young and the old. You know what I learned from Anas ibn Malik? He passed some shabab, some youngsters, and he told them, assalamu alaikum. I thought about this, and then he said, that's what the prophet used to do. Now, I want you to think about this. I tried this. I tested it. I want you to test it, out of. I want you to look at the elders when they pass a group of, of youngsters. 
and see if the elders ever give them salams. Hmm? Right, can you imagine? No guys playing in the prophet said, Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. It's concern. And the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said that sometime he goes intending, he stands up for salat, intending to read a long surah. And he hears a baby cry. And he shortens his prayer because he don't want to put the mother in any burden. Sensitivity, being sensitive. And now I feel we, are, we should feel sensitive to everybody, every Muslim, uh, sister from uh, 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 Iran. We should, be, we should, we should do something. The, the brothers from Holy Land Foundation and other political prisoners, prisoners, we should do something, not just say something. First make dua and, and then do something. So brothers and sisters, all we have, all manner is, is an, an effort to do some good work. That's all. To try to work together as Muslims so that we can achieve some goals for all of us, all of the seven million Muslims in America, inshallah. That's all it's all about. And finally, I figured it out. Dr. Jamal, I agree with you. But by, by the way, I, by the way, I've never disagreed agreed with you publicly. Never. But I just want to, and, and you said it, you clarified it, but I do think it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's maturity to recognize that some Muslims have different priorities. It's, n it's nothing wrong with that. I mean, in other words, in terms of what resonates for that, as you said in your, in, in your talk, so, and, and, and the reason I'm saying that is because something that happened to Imam Talib. He was in a meeting with some immigrant Muslims. And they were talking, an organization, they were talking about their priorities. And they listed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And number one was the biggest priority, highest priority. And number ten was the least. And they said, Imam, what do you think about this, this list? He said, well, if it were in my community, what you have as 10 would be one for us. And what you have one would be 10 for us. So that's okay, that's, that's, that's like maturity. Because where we are, people have different needs and different concerns and uh, like that. And that's why I say politically, it's important for Muslims to sit down together and say, okay, what kind of agenda can we put collectively that's gonna benefit most of us or the majority of us? Last thing, I got it, I'm finished. I'm gonna bring Qasim, come on. I'm gonna bring Imam Qasim up. We got a couple minutes before Salat. And, and the, the reason I'm standing him up, the reason that I'm standing him up, he's a money man. I'm not a money man, I don't know how to raise money. What? What? Uh, what are you talking about? But let me tell you, you know what I learned, Dr. Jamal? Muhammad, Sunusi, you know what I learned? Let me tell you what I learned. Dr. Majid, you know what I learned? Unity ain't up to us. Don't misunderstand me. Don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. I bear witness what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran. أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مَنَا الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَلَأَنْفَقْتَ مَا فِي الْعَدِّ جَمِيعًا مَا أَلَّفْتَ مَا بَيْنَ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَلَكِنَ اللَّهَ أَلَّفَ بَيْنَهُمْ إِنَّهُ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ Join your hearts together. Not if you spend all of the money on the earth. Muhammad, Allah is speaking to one man. It's, it's ambiguous in English. You is ambiguous. You could be you male, you female, you all. But in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you is very clear. You anta, alafta. You, Muhammad, could not have done it. Allah did it. And you know what I learned from that? The key is, why did Imam Muhammad and the rest of the Muslims come together? What brought their hearts together? It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because we followed the thing that brings us the unity. And you were enemies, and Allah joined your hearts together. 
That's the key because we follow the same thing, the Quran and the Sunnah. That's the key. And if we do that, inshallah, Allah will join our hearts together. This brother is going to talk to your heart for a couple of minutes and ask you to give a couple of dollars, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar.